let's get started. Um, we're uh, very pleased today to be joined more by two colleagues, Dr. Kershandi and Dr. Berghoff uh, from Star Experts. We're going to be talking about for insomnia. Um, can everybody mute their phones and we'll take questions at the end. Um, we'll do a chat button. Um, so insomnia is a big problem. It's sometimes it's hormonally related, sometimes it's not. I've talked uh, I've several talks about some of the endocrine effects, and I'll summarize them in between the presentations by Dr. Prashanti and Dr. Berghoff. So we can go ahead and get started. I'm Theodore Friedman. I'm the chairman of the Department of Medicine and Chief of Endocrinology at Charles G. University and a professor of medicine. Barbara. Hi, I'm Dr. Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Barbara Burgraff. Um, I'm boarded in both ear, nose, and throat and uh, sleep medicine, and I'm the medical director for Snore Experts, um, fellow in both the American Academy of Otolaryngology and sleep medicine, and i um, happy to be here tonight. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Dr. Jay Corsandi. Uh, I've been in uh, dentistry and sleep for almost 20 years, um, doing all kinds of different things. At this point, I am uh, committed to sleep and um, co-developing of an oral appliance that's called the Zipa K, which we can talk about later. Uh, very familiar with CPAPs. Uh, we do a, a nightly therapy that made for snoring that can help people with sleep. Uh, I guess most importantly for this is uh, I'm, I'm a sleep enthusiast and, and what's called a biohacker. So I like to play with uh, different gadgets and supplements and then the environment and biology and uh, find ways to kind of hack the system to get the best out of uh, sleep. So uh, you'll hear more about that as we go along. Oh, quick announcement here for the people joining us. Uh, we're going to do a giveaway. So uh, I encourage you to stay until the end of the presentation. Uh, we're going to give away uh, an amazing supplement. It's, it's one of my favorites. I actually call it liquid meditation. And uh, it can help calm the mind and help you sleep better. Uh, so stick around for that. We'll pick someone at the end of the presentation and get one of these out to you. And I think you're going to love it. <clears throat> Okay, um, I can take this one here. So, so why do we sleep, right? Uh, and I mentioned this in, in my podcast as well. I call it the three R's. Uh, the purpose of sleep is to really uh, rest, recharge, and restore. Uh, we all know that when we go to sleep, uh, historically, it was just, you know, lights out, go to sleep. But uh, it, it's a much more active process. Uh, in the beginning, it is a time to slow down. It's, a, it's a, an opportunity to give your body a chance to recover from the day. Obviously, uh, stresses of work, everything takes a toll. Uh, we need uh, energy consumption to go down, heart rate to go down, and the digestion to slow down. All of these will help us fall asleep better. Uh, as far as recharging, uh, this is one of the things that I deal with in the practice is people who are coming in to see me are not recharging. In essence, it's the, like their phone's not being plugged back in their cell phone. Uh, but when you are doing it optimally, uh, there's biological, uh, biochemical processes in the brain that are happening. There's hormone regulations, as Dr. Freeman can talk about. Uh, and there's something called the lymphatic system, which was uh, more recently researched and uh, involves the brain, actually the spaces between the, the brain tissue uh, and cerebral spinal fluid flushing out um, toxins and byproducts that we have with them throughout the day. So very uh, important systems. And lastly, we want to restore. Uh, we want to get our deep sleep, uh, which releases growth hormone and uh, repair uh, body tissues. And we want to get uh, good REM sleep, uh, where we're you know, consolidating uh, memories, uh, filtering bad things, uh, remembering good things. And I kind of say it's like a disk defrag on your hard drive, if you remember how that was back in the day. Uh, here's one way that I'd like to describe how uh, the controls of sleep are. Um, it basically comes out of two components. There's a rhythm and a drive. Um, so what does that mean, right? Rhythm basically means it's your sleep-wake cycle. It's your circadian rhythm. It's uh, kind of like an internal clock. Um, it's actually uh, research is showing that, you know, all of our major organ systems actually have uh, 
this rhythm or, or circadian rhythm, and uh, now research is showing optimal times of taking medications based on uh, how it's going to metabolize. But uh, for this purpose, we're going to talk about the brain rhythm, and uh, that's going to tell us when to go to sleep, when to wake up. Uh, shift workers, people who have kind of an overnight graveyard shift, are constantly battling with this. Uh, they may be in opposition with this all the time. Uh, and if you've ever traveled anywhere more than a couple hour difference in time zone, uh, you're going to feel effective rhythm much more, uh, and that's called jet lag. Jay, can you say a little bit about how that has to do with the sunlight and the yeah, date hours? Yeah, so it's funny because I was actually just on a trip recently to Europe, and uh, it was a big deal trying to kind of hack my jet lag, and I actually was able to succeed with it because there is a big uh, solar component to it. Because if you're leaving at a certain time and you're arriving at a certain time, that's many hours different you need to be cognizant of, of how to control your your sleep um but yeah i mean you can kind of get into it too as well but uh it, it's a it, if you're able to kind of understand the fundamentals of it then you're able to control it so like when i arrived in europe i i fell asleep that night had the best sleep i've had in this year and woke up like as, as if i've been there for a week which was fantastic that means no time lost in that kind of cloudy fog. And then we're going to talk about drive here. Okay, so drive. So rhythm is basically your cycle on off type thing. So what is the pressure to sleep? It's kind of like uh, it's reminders that the body needs to sleep after a certain amount of time. Uh, think of it like a timer or counter that counts down throughout the day uh, to reserve. Uh, so, essentially, the longer you've been awake, the stronger the desire and the need to sleep becomes, uh, and, and the more likely you fall asleep. Uh, and then, uh, conversely, the longer you've been asleep, the more uh, this pressure dissipates and the more likelihood of waking increases. In other words, um, if we want to fall asleep at the end of the day, we need to almost kind of earn it by uh, expending energy, uh, whether it's mental or physical or both, and then that will help to ensure that we fall asleep uh, within the kind of appropriate amount of time. And if you don't spend that energy during the day, you don't get tired? Correct, yeah. I mean, then what's called sleep efficiency gets messed up because then you, your body is still in a mode that you still need to do more. And then the mind is going to chatter uh, or, or you're not going to have the, the, the kind of physical tiredness and then that's when the insomnia could become an issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, trouble falling asleep and waking up. So falling asleep, um, if you have trouble falling asleep, there, there could be a, a number of things going on. Obviously, we're going to talk about it through the, this entire presentation, but one could be work-related stress. We all have issues at work at time to time, and, and that could be uh, a factor. Uh, there could be acute psychological risk or trauma. Uh, that's going to be uh, a big factor, whether there's... Um, if your child is sick or got injured or you a car accident or a number of different things, but that can short-term cause insomnia type issues. Family stress, obviously, we've all been there, and lifestyle choices, and, and that could, and we're going to talk about those as well. As far as waking up, uh, and this is very common, you know, people will say, I wake uh, it could be from a number of things. Uh, it could be brain energy expenditure, and I'll get into what that means. And basically, uh, as we sleep, and we're going to the active process of the sleep, uh, we could run out of energy. And the brain will actually say, well, I need to wake up uh, because uh, it's done. Uh, and it could be from sleep apnea. And, and that's what I deal with specifically. But uh, that becomes to any of the, uh, of the above. Uh, and then trouble waking up in the morning. So people say, I don't feel refreshed when I wake up. Again, that could be coming from insomnia, poor sleep quality, snoring, sleep apnea, back to lifestyle choices. Uh, and we're going to get into ways to uh, reduce these uh, so you can wake up feeling a lot better. Uh, okay, let, let's keep going here. So this is something uh, that was... Um, talked a lot about by a colleague of mine. His name is Dr. Michael Bruce. He's a sleep doctor. He's um, very famous on Dr. Oz and Oprah. Uh, he wrote a book called The Power of When. Uh, and he basically discusses, discusses what's called a chronotype. And a chronotype basically is what kind of sleeper are you 
he breaks it down into four categories, and I'm going to briefly go over these because you'll see why uh, when we get to the last one. But um, let's talk about some animals here and, and understand how your sleep is affected. First one is, I believe, a lion. Let's see, can we get to that? Okay, lions. So lions are known as the early birds. So we've heard of early birds. Uh, these are the people who want to wake up early. They're the most productive in the morning. Uh, and they get most of the productivity in before noon. Uh, so they're naturally tired in the evening and go to sleep early. So these are the people that if you call up your friends and say, hey, let's go out tonight, let's go watch a movie, most likely they're going to say, uh, not going to happen because I don't stay up that late. Uh, and they're about 15 to 20% of the population. And if you see the, the correlation of the way if you pick these animals, it's based on their actual natural behavior. So there's a lion in the early morning sun. The next one is the wolves. Wolves are the night owls. So these are the people who tend to go to sleep and wake later than others. Uh, they're the ones who like kind of quote unquote burn the midnight oil. Uh, they happen to have peak productivity more in the middle of the day and into the evening after everyone else is already kind of logged off. Uh, wolves represent about 15 to 20 percent of the population. So those are two of kind of the more minor categories. We're going to get into the next one, which is bears. Okay, this is about 50 percent of the population. It's what I am. Uh, if you're curious what animal you are, uh, there's a link. I don't know if I have it on here, but it's called thepowerofwhenquiz.com. And you can go to that website, and he'll take you through a survey, and he'll tell you what kind of animal you are, which might help you reconfigure your sleep routine. But uh, bears tend to, they are the circadian version. Uh, they tend to sleep and wake according to the sun, uh, feeling most energetic throughout the day, uh, no trouble generally falling asleep at night. Again, these are kind of mid-morning productivity people. Uh, by mid-afternoon, they tend to kind of wane off. Uh, most people are about one in two people are like this, and, and uh, find out what you are. I'm a bear. <laughs> Okay, and the last one here is the dolphin. So dolphins, uh, if you know or you may not know, they, when they sleep, they actually sleep by hemispherically, meaning you know only in half of their brain is asleep at a time because the other half is focused on swimming and going up for air. So uh, in relation to humans, this kind of means that they're a little bit more erratic. Uh, they're, they're light sleepers. They have a difficulty following a regular sleep routine, uh, more frequent nighttime awakenings. Uh, they produ they're more productive in the mid-morning to early afternoon. They're about 10% of the population, and based off the research, these are the kinds of people who are most likely to suffer from insomnia. So that's why I wanted to kind of bring this little animal thing to you. Uh, Dr. J, two questions. Do people change with their lifespan, and also can you change yourself from one type to another? Yes, but, uh, both. Uh, as we go through life, you can change. Uh, generally, it's more built into the... Uh, Genetics, but yeah, if you control certain environments, you can change. And also, you know, we tend to sleep less as we get older too, so we may shift towards uh, more early bird type stuff as we get older. Uh, and then the other question is, what was the other question? Do we change or, you know, can you change and do you change? You sort of answer them both. So if you get older, you can switch to become more of a uh, of a lion. Yes, yes, you can change, and, and what you can do, again, too, is you can control it, too, uh, by doing certain things, hacks, supplements, light exposure, uh, if you need to perform a certain way. I mean, some people who are, like, shift workers and a normal circadian-type animal, well, they have to find, figure out a way to kind of work, you know, cheat the system, so to speak. But, yeah. All right, um, insomnia. So, you know, we're talking about people who have trouble or difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep. Um, the technical definition of insomnia is difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep even when a person has the chance to do so. So this isn't like if you're purposely not trying to fall asleep, but this is when you actually have a nice cozy bed trying to go to sleep and it's just not happening. Uh, people with insomnia can feel dissatisfied. Um, they're usually grumpy or depressed or both. Uh, obviously, some signs of fatigue, low energy, difficulty concentrating, mood disturbances, uh, the decreased performances in work or at school. I mean, you have to think about it this way. A lot of the patients that I see coming in with sleep disorder breathing also are suffering from insomnia because they're choking. Uh, 
20, 30, 40 times an hour at night, and, and they're getting poor quality sleep. So if you're getting poor quality sleep, uh, that's going to affect your performance, whether it is at work, at school, as a parent. Um, I always tell patients, imagine you're taking a cross-country flight on a jet and your pilot has insomnia or sleep apnea and got poor sleep last night. Or if you're going in for a surgery first thing in the morning and your surgeon has got poor quality sleep. Would you want to be that person under that knife? So let's keep going here. Okay, this is, uh, I guess, my slide. Yeah, you can kind of get into these things, uh-huh. Okay, so medicines. I think a lot of medicines cause insomnia, um, and they include uh, the SSRIs, uh, such as Prozac or Zoloft, although many people I put on Zoloft and I help with sleep. Uh, could everybody mute their phones, please? Mute your phones, the audience. Um, Zoloft, um, I often give at night, and a lot of times it doesn't give insomnia, but sometimes it does. Dopamine agonists, including medicines for Parkinson's disease, psychostimulants and amphetamines, you know, the people that are on Ritalin, uh, they should definitely take it in the morning. Um, the, uh, also, some of the diet pills can cause that. Anticonvulsants, cold medicines, decongestants, especially those um, the decongestants um, can often give people um, trouble sleeping. Steroids like prednisone, uh, beta agonists. Um, we use for uh, asthma a lot of times, theophylline, medications to lower blood pressure. These include alpha agonists, beta blockers, and clonidine is another one that's frequently uh, a culprit for this. Diuretics can do it. So if you're on a diuretic like Lasix, that I call it Please, all, everybody, mute your phone in the audience. Uh, if you're on a, um, a diuretic, take it in the morning. Don't take it in the evening, otherwise you have to go to the bathroom at night, and that will wake you up. Uh, appetite suppressants, uh, some of those medicines. Caffeine is definitely a medicine that gives insomnia. Alcohol has a biphasic response. Initially, people feel tired after they drink, and then they feel wide awake about three or four hours after they, um, after they finish their alcohol. So if you have um, a beer for dinner, you might be having trouble falling asleep a couple hours down the road. And niacin, a medicine that used to be used for triglycerides, um, is also another culprit here. Um, And I wanted, I don't think I put it on the slide, but I do want to uh, comment that patients with adrenal insufficiency, I did do a study when I was at the NIH that they, people with adrenal insufficiency need some steroids before they go to bed. So both too much steroids and too little steroids are bad and doesn't give you deep sleep. So I often get my patient with Addison's disease or had adrenalectomies, a low dose of hydrocortisone, like five milligrams before they go to bed. Okay, Dr. J? Yeah, that, that's a good one there, yeah. Okay, so uh, treatments for insomnia, uh, we're going to go over a couple different uh, options here, and I think we have uh, hormonal in there as well, too, which you can talk about. Um, right. But uh, behavioral, psychological, medical, and alternative. So, uh, yeah, let's go through it. Okay, so behavioral options, uh, I always like to start as least invasive as possible with patients. Uh, this has to do with sleep hygiene. Uh, sleep has become a very hot topic in our culture these days, uh, and people are starting to pay more attention to it. So a couple of handy tips you can do to get better sleep, uh, keep, you know, consistent sleep and awake cycle, you know, uh, sleeping in on the weekends to kind of catch up isn't going to do you any better. So you want to just kind of stay in the same zone every day. People that um, stay up late on the weekend, uh, and like, and then, they, uh, uh, then on Monday they go to bed early. I was just going to add yeah. something, Dr. J. So people that stay awake on the weekends and then have to go to bed at the regular time on Monday and they, get, they can't fall asleep because they're used to staying up, and then they wake up with only four hours of sleep starting on Monday, it's called social jet lag. And I think it's a big problem. So I completely agree. Ah. Try to keep your sleep similar every night. Yeah, yeah. And, and there could be, you know, there's a, obviously some, so you got to balance the social consequences because like if, if you're at a party on a Saturday night, if I'm at a party on Saturday at nine, nine o'clock at night, I usually say I need to check out. I need to go home and get started get ready for bed. And people, you know, may look at you funny, but you know, you, you kind of have to draw the line of where you want to perform on a sleep level. Mm -hmm. So it's jet lag. I like that. So, uh, some other things you could do to kind of promote better sleep, light control, keep a pitch black room, uh, blackout curtains, take some electrical tape and cover up all your little uh, chargers and uh, indicators. Uh, all those little lights, uh, 
they may not be super bright, but they're enough to potentially interfere with melatonin release. Um, temperature control, you want to keep a cool room as we get into the summer months now. It's more important. Uh, 68 degrees or less is kind of the optimal temperature. That's chilly. Uh, and one of the things that I do instead of kind of air conditioning the entire house is uh, I have uh, cooling sheets in my bed that actually reduce the temperature in the bed itself so I don't have to freeze everybody else in the whole house. Uh, alcohol. Uh, alcohol is going to be, like you mentioned, it, it's got that kind of biphasic effect. Um, I always like to say uh, about one drink per hour is when you want to do the cutoff because uh, it takes about that much time to metabolize out. Uh, with diet control, you want to try and eat around sunset and not too close to bedtime. Uh, the later we eat, the, the more that's going to interfere with melatonin release as well. Uh, electronics, uh, and we're going to get into more of this as well, uh, phones, tablets, TVs within one hour of sleep. I call it, I call it the power down hour uh, where we just try and stay away from that stuff, not only because of the blue light emitted from these. And then we're not talking about blue light like a police car. We're just talking about kind of white non-native light where that's uh, blocking the uh, release of melatonin. But not only that, it's also the content. Uh, you know, you're going to be reading about just mindless stuff a lot of times on these phones, and, and that's not what you need to be uh, pumping into your brain at the middle of the night. But it's all good. And uh, last one here, I just kind of threw it in there, but make sure you or your partner doesn't snore or have sleep apnea. Uh, that could be a big thing. Your research has shown that, that people, partners or people who snore have apnea on average lose one hour of sleep per night. And then obviously the person who is snoring with apnea is, is tearing apart their sleep uh, architecture as well. So uh, both of those could be very important to uh, promoting better night sleep. Okay. Uh, on the psychological end of it, uh, this is called CBTI, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia. Uh, this is prescribed by sleep physicians as another way to combat insomnia, and, and the goal is to work with the therapist uh, to control and eliminate negative thoughts or actions that keep you awake. Uh, so this is a, a bit more of a commitment. Uh, it involves kind of looking back uh, into your beliefs and into your habits and into your mindset about sleep and trying to work those things out through uh, therapy. Uh, Dr. Barber, you have any uh, takeaways on that, on this one? Yeah, I think you're going to talk a little bit about um, meditation uh, mm -hmm. in the next couple of slides, and I think it can also contribute to that psychological element of sort of catastrophizing our insomnia. Mm. Yeah, it, indeed. Yeah. So whether you want to do it kind of in a, in a clinical setting with a, with a therapist or you want to do it kind of more on a personal level through mindfulness and meditation, uh, both of those are, are, are great ways to reduce that burden on your on your brain at night so you can sleep better. Yeah. And much preferred over, um, you know, prescription medications in most <laughs> cases. Yeah, yeah, which is the next slide here. And uh, let's see, medical. So speaking of uh, prescription medications, you can kind of go over these here. Obviously, this is the pharmaceutical route. Uh, this is going to require, you know, appointments, consultations with uh, your physician. And uh, there are potential side effects here that you may not get from behavioral therapy modification or just something as simple as blacking out your room uh, or avoiding alcohol. But uh, let's get into some of these options here. I think it's on the next slide. And you can talk about these if you like. There we go. Yeah, so so there, yeah, go for it. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'd be happy to, to hear what you have to say, too. But, I mean, there's, um, you know, there's several different options. One of the older methods is, are the, um, you know, the benzodiazepines. They're still used today, but um, what we know about the benzos is they do tend to have quite a few side effects. And in particular, the risk of addiction or, or rebound insomnia um, daytime tiredness, um, risk for dependence, and they can affect um, your sleep, the, the way that you sleep too at night in terms of um, decreasing our REM sleep or even our um, deep sleep. So um, the second one on the list here is what's called the non-benzodiazepines or the non-benzobenzos. And those are the drugs people are fairly familiar with, the Zolipidem, Zolp um, Sonata, Lunesta, and they're used pretty frequently. 
Um, they do have less of a risk for addiction than the benzodiazepines, but they do still have a risk for um, abuse and side effects. So we'd like to stay away from those if possible. Um, melatonin um, is a you know natural hormone made by our body. Um, that's a medication that you can actually get over the counter. Um, and then there's things, medications that actually help our body release its own melatonin, uh, the drugs like uh, uh, Roserem and um, the, the abuse potential is much less in those particular medications. You, you know, one of the funny things I, I find out with these drugs is that they all have very romantic names like Intermezzo and Sonata and Lunetta. <laughs> they, 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 right? I, I, it's such a marketing thing, but... Uh, it is. The, they're not as romantic as they sound. <laughs> exactly. 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 All right, what else we got? Ah. Yeah, so um, sometimes um, physicians will use antidepressants, uh, in particular ones that have the side effect of sleepiness. So medications like a tricyclic antidepressants like doxepin um, can be used. Um, people too tend to complain of that kind of hangover feeling in the morning um, with that one that doesn't that doesn't go away very fast either. Um, and then there's what's called the orexin receptor agonist, um, things like uh, Belsorma, and this is a, a relatively newer category of insomnia medications. Um, orexins are these neurotransmitters that help regulate our wakefulness and our sleep. Um, and this medication basically um, helps to block its action. So we can even treat people who have narcolepsy with that. So it helps you stay awake. So this medication would actually block that action. And so you'd have the opposite effect, which would be sleepiness. And again, supposedly less side effects with this one, but not without its side effects as well. All medications do have side effects to some extent. So if a patient fails the sleep hygiene and the high CBT, which one of these do you go to first and how do you decide one versus another, would you say? So if they if they failed um the first two, if they fail the um CBTI, I would probably not go to a medication before I would try other methods, mm -hmm. including perhaps some over-the-counter medications, some supplements, um, and Jay's going to talk about um, some more holistic methods, mm -hmm. um, including meditation and other things, before I resorted to pharmaceuticals. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, this I think we went over before a little bit. I did add also thyroid medicines. Um, if people take their thyroid medicines often at night or on too much medicine, um, they can get uh, insomnia. Also, so, quick question for you: Yeah, how do patients with like Hashimoto's uh, deal with uh, sleep? Right. So, you know, most people traditionally have been given their thyroid medicine in the morning, um, and if you're taking T4, it has a long half life, so it doesn't really matter that much when you take it. And some people, there's been some in, uh, people that are promoted taking it at night, so it doesn't interfere with your other medicines. But if you take something that has T3 in it, like Cytomel or desiccated thyroid, like Armour Thyroid or MT3 that has the T3 in it, the T3 in it can keep you awake at night. So those people, are usually, it should be given twice a day, but I usually have people take it around the, th the second dose about three in the afternoon, so it's somewhat out of their system by um, the um, by the time they go to bed. Um, I also added bladder medicines. I see a lot of side effects of these medicines. Um, I don't think they're that well recognized. Uh, Ditropan and Mibertrix can give people, um, you know, pretty bad insomnia. And these are given to elderly people that are prone to insomnia anyways a lot. So I think those medicines you want to be careful with. Can cause insomnia. Yeah, and one of the things, too, that, that I just, you know, just looking at the slides, you could see the, the sheer number of different things that can interfere with sleep. So uh, definitely, if people out there are taking any of these, you should uh, you know check with your physician and see if there's 
uh, alternatives or different dosages if you find that this is can, interfering with the steroids. I'm sorry, what did you say, Dr. Barber? Um, I don't think I said anything. I think okay. Uh, okay, something else and it might have said it. something. Okay, yeah. okay. okay so um, I'm going to talk about hormone treatments. I would say the number one cause I see of um, insomnia and poor sleep is menopausal issues. And uh, I think menopausal issues are a very severe health issue. And part of the problem is the people with menopause, the women with menopause, or perimenopause, they get the hot flashes, it makes their sleeping miserable. They wake up constantly, they don't get into good sleep, um, and this is really a, you know, sort of a women's health issue that is pretty easily treated. Um, the first thing I usually do on sort of mild hot flashes, I give them vitamin E, 400 units a day, and there's several publications that show that helps with sort of mild or hot flashes with really no side effects. So that would certainly be a good choice for some people. The other thing, people, a lot of people I do put on estrogen progesterone combinations. If you do have a uterus in place, you need to be on progesterone. Progesterone itself is usually very sedating and helps with sleep, but it can give you some weight gain and, um, and some bloating and swelling. But often the lower dose of progesterone is a progesterone cream. You can balance in that it does help your sleep and it doesn't give you the side effects. Estrogens, I usually give a topical estrogens, either estrogel or an estrogen patch. Um, they seem to work better than the the orals, and the orals interfere with a lot of other hormones. So I think, uh, you know, many of the people that come to me, one of their problems is though it has to do with insomnia, is they're menopausal, and I do try to treat them. Um, an interesting medicine, uh, supplement is called phosphatidylserine. It's also called Seraphos, and it lowers nighttime cortisol. So it's a high cortisol at night can give people the um, insomnia, and the Seraphos is an <laughs> over-the-counter supplement and get it on Amazon. It's also called phosphatidylserine. You take it about an hour before you go to bed, and that lowers nighttime cortisol. Uh, DHEA, 25 milligrams in women and 50 milligrams in men at night, also counteracts the effect of cortisol, and that could help. And again, we're talking about people that have, you know, sort of stress and mildly elevated cortisol, not the people with Cushing's, but the people with slightly elevated cortisol. These supplements are good. Ginkgo biloba, 120 milligrams twice a day can lower cortisol, and the hormone the supplement called Cerevital. It's also available over the counter and available at Costco. Raises growth hormone levels, certainly not as much as growth hormone itself, but that's a good uh, way to get um, some better sleep um, in people. Um, I didn't have my slide here. I think we got um, you know, to, to take it off when we were doing the editing, but also you know, diseases that can give you hormone tr hormonal problems that can give you sleep problems would be the Cushing's disease, high cortisol at night, growth hormone deficiency, hyperthyroidism, with the high, um, high, high thyroid hormones and overtreatment with, of hyperthyroidism and can do it also, plus the uh, menopausal issues. Um, could I just add one thing bet, to the sure. menopausal issues? Um, paradoxically, a lot of times you'll also see those symptoms improve with some of the SSRIs, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which are on the list of, you know, medications that, can affect sleep in a in a negative way, but sometimes they can really help yeah. um, with these particular symptoms as well. So it's a little bit of a balance. Mm -hmm. Very good, right? And um, you know, I think we're going to maybe Dr. Jay's going to get to this. I think the best antidepressant and the best treatment for menopause is exercise. Um, I think exercise does lower, you know, raise your cortisol short term, but eventually sort of lowers your cortisol and gets you to have a better circadian rhythm. You do want to exercise not late at night, but the people that have exercised, it's been shown that it helps with menopause issues and with um, the insomnia and, and with depression. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> and yeah, it, it is, it's amazing how many of those things on that previous slide were cortisol related. And uh, people don't tend to understand how critical of a hormone that is, especially at night when you really don't want it. And, you know, the exercise is a great option, uh, and same with the mindfulness and meditation, which we're going to do. Any way you can get to decrease that. I mean, obviously, cortisol is helpful in the morning to wake up and go about your day, and it's, a, a, and it's needed for a stress response for acute stuff. But uh, having that throughout your body throughout the night is uh, definitely something you don't want. So uh, alternative options. This is kind of the stuff that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, I enjoy a lot of these things. Uh, I've gotten very deep into this, and it could be kind of a rabbit hole where you can kind of go further and further down. Uh, but I'll try and keep it more on a general level here. 
And uh, we're going to go through some of these here, supplements, light control, meditation, EMF mitigation, and dietary considerations. So uh, let's get to it. Okay, so uh, as far as supplements go, uh, these are some of the things that I've used, I've recommended, uh, I've had good success with. Uh, and the first one is called GABA with L-theanine. Uh, and that's basically GABA is the main uh, inhibitory neurotransmitter in your brain. Uh, I tell patients it's kind of like lowering the volume uh, of, your, of your brain at night, the chatter. Uh, and that's uh, one of the supplements that we have that um, it's a spray that goes under your tongue. It's a sublingual spray. Uh, and when you do that, it helps to promote kind of a calm uh, wellness type feeling. Uh, and L-theanine is basically what's in green tea. And it also gives that kind of zen calm uh, feeling. Uh, melatonin we've talked about before. It's what's released at night to promote sleep. Uh, some people can supplement with that as well. Um, Dr. Friedman recommends, I think, did you say three milligrams to start? Yeah, I usually start with three and then either go down or up sometimes. Yep. Different people respond to different doses. Exactly. It's a titration thing. Uh, for me, melatonin, I don't use it too often, but uh, big butt is when I travel. And melatonin is absolutely fantastic for reset, resetting circadian uh, rhythms. And when I did just go recently to Europe, uh, that was one of my uh, biggest tools. Uh, so valerian root, uh, it's more of an ancient type, uh, it's a, it's a root and it's, um, not the most pleasant smelling, but people tend to, uh, get success with that one. These are all supplements that are over the counter. 5-HTP, uh, that has a very kind of imposing clinical name to it, but it stands for 5-hydroxytryptophan and it's a precursor to, uh, serotonin, which get, gets then converted into melatonin. So some people find that one helpful. Uh, CBD oil. Uh, this is a hot topic right now. Uh, I've had uh, a couple different ones that I've tried, and uh, a, a more recent one that I've had was absolutely fantastic uh, in helping my sleep. Uh, and uh, I'm going to listen to my wife tonight, actually. She hasn't tried it yet. So uh, it can be a, a game changer for some people. It has uh, anti anxiety properties, anti inflammatory properties, and it ends up with uh, getting more deep sleep. Uh, lavender and chamomile, these are more just kind of herbal type stuff. Uh, obviously, you're not ingesting these, but uh, aromatherapy or a, a tea can help as well. Light control, again, this is another one that's big for me. Uh, we're talking about light at night. That's what I call non-native. In other words, Mother Nature didn't create this. Uh, obviously, with the invent of the light bulb, this is the worst. And then just within the last 10 years or so with cell phones and iPads and, and laptops, uh, we're getting way too much light exposure at night at a, at a blue light frequency uh, that can interfere, again, with sleep. Uh, not fun in production. Uh, one of the ways to deal with that is with what's called blue light blocking glasses. Um, these are popular right now in this kind of biohacking arena that I'm in, and you'll see a lot of people wearing these with a kind of orange tint. And what that does is it filters out some of the spectrums of the more blue light uh, to allow your brain to start to settle down. Uh, I actually have a pair of orange ones and I have a pair of red ones that look like the red in the top right corner here that actually filter out every single wavelength of light except that red that will uh, trick the brain into thinking you're in a pitch black cave, uh, which is really cool. Actually, one hour of wearing those at night and I'm ready to go to sleep. Wow. Very powerful. Are they prescription? They are not. No, you can get them on Amazon, uh, anywhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, an amazing... Um, but it's like can, taking Benadryl. It's, it's can crazy. Can you get them in prescription if you need it, or you put them over your glasses? You, you can get them with prescription glasses, yes. Oh, did you mean you, need, you don't need yeah. a prescription to buy them, but, no, if, you, but if you have glasses, you can yeah. have your glasses converted with the prescription into them with these colors. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about this here, but there, there's what the supplement looks like, and we're actually going to give away one of these at the end. I know I mentioned this at the beginning. This is one of my favorite supplements. It is uh, this liposomal GABA, it's a spray, goes under your tongue. Uh, absorption is within minutes, and it's like literally, I call it liquid. Your eyes and sit for 10, 20 minutes. It may not promote you to go to sleep, but this is the one where patients say they come in and they say they just can't turn their brain off at night. A uh, couple pumps of this, and things get things get better. It's an amazing thing. And uh, what else? Okay, melatonin. We talked about this one as well, too. Obviously, this is probably the most known sleep supplement that people know out there. Uh, 
it's also an antioxidant, um, which people may not know, and, and it has uh, potential anti-cancer properties. But um, in a regular sleep cycle, this is what you need when you're uh, flying across time zones, like I mentioned. This is when you can use this. Uh, and back to the whole kind of um, chronotype in animal and, and sleep-wake cycles, if you're a shift worker, uh, this is something that you might need to help uh, get you to go to sleep when your body actually wants to be awake. Uh, and the doses just can be like uh, Dr. Friedman said, you know, I like to start slower, one milligram move up, but some people uh, like to go, you know, I think three milligrams is also a good place to start. This one is actually a lot more potent uh, because of the sublingual uh, absorption. The bioavailability is much higher, so uh, I start a little bit slower with this one. And then this is the CBD oil. We talked about this as well, too. So, uh, you know, it seems like almost everyone has the CBD oil out there. There are some that are better, some that are worse. Uh, I'm still playing around with these. I, I think the potential for these is, is quite optimistic and quite high. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, benefiting from these, uh, both as uh, ingesting and also topically. You can actually use these for uh, aches and pains, which if some people actually have you know, uh, joint issues, body issues, shoulder issues, uh, that itself may lead to insomnia or poor sleep quality because you, you don't want to be in pain while you're trying to sleep at night. That'll keep you up as well. I'm getting a little feedback here. There we go. Uh, so we talked about all these different things here. This is actually my little... Uh, stash of supplements that I just took to uh, Europe. I was in the airport lounge and uh, opened up all these and people started looking at me very strangely, but um, there's a combination of things in there, uh, vitamin D, uh, antioxidants, uh, turmeric, uh, fish oils. So uh, I tend to take all kinds of different things there and that's a cup of tea behind it, not wine. <laughs> Uh, if you are interested in these uh, supplements, uh, we don't have them at 7-Eleven, but we do have them in our uh, offices uh, where we treat patients for snoring and sleep apnea. But it's also available on our website, snoreexperts.com, in the snore sec store section. Snore section. Uh, we have those available there. Uh, it's been a huge hit for patients. So uh, if you have any questions about those, you can put them in the chat box here, or you can come see me, and I can tell you all about them more in person. And we're going to give away a bottle of this GABA which is my favorite, at the end of this presentation. Ah, so here's a picture of me. This was last week on the flight over to Europe. Uh, I don't typically wear a baseball cap, but uh, I had a hat. On. Well, this was on a plane. This is about 2, I think, in the morning, local time. Um, but people have lights on. They're reading stuff at night. Uh, and I actually put a hat on, put these glasses on, and uh, went to sleep. And uh, any kind of light that came through was not an issue. A um, couple things you could do, too, is uh, consider your LEDs at home. I know people like to have these blue-white light, you know, daytime type things, but that's actually making things a lot worse. Uh, you can go back into the warmer colors of your LEDs or, even better yet, go back old school and become incandescent. Uh, they still sell them as, uh, I think they're called party lights or uh, novelty lights. Uh, so they still do make incandescent bulbs. Um, it's kind of bad, bulbs, actually. <laughs> it's really big. You know what? It's funny. I, I recommend everybody on this webinar to go tonight to CVS or Walgreens or anywhere like that, Target, and and look at how much intensity of light is coming out at night at these places. Like, I can't even go in them anymore unless I wear, like, a hat and glasses. Oh. It's worse than being at a beach at noon. So much powerful light. Well, maybe they should go during the day tomorrow. If they go at night, they're not going to sleep. It, you know what? That's the thing. But we're all busy with work commitments. It's yeah. hard to go during the day. Yes, you know, sometimes you have to go after work. But at night, if you're going to go into these, you might want to think twice because going into those is like getting hit with your face right in front of like a tanning bed. It's, it's outrageous the amount of power that's coming out of these lights. Yeah. Terrible. Terrible. And, yeah. And then what else we got here? Okay. Uh, meditation, mindfulness. Uh, I've recently kind of partnered up with a meditation teacher and uh, did a whole course on this, uh, spent a couple months kind of diving deep into this. Um, again, this is kind of uh, hip and trendy now to develop a meditation practice. 
one of the recommendations that he told me, which was interesting, is you know doing it twice a day for 10 minutes each is better than doing one 20-minute session. And and literally, meditation doesn't have to be as sound as people. Everybody, put on microphones. It's, it's as simple as basically just finding a quiet place. I mean, I'll go during lunch uh, in my car and just, you know, shut everything down, close my eyes 10 minutes and just breathe and just focus on that. And, and that's all it takes, you know, twice a day with that. It will actually uh, change the brain waves in, in your head. It go from like a beta wave to more of an alpha wave, which is where we're into a, a calm, relaxed state, lower cortisol levels, and then help uh, promote a better sleep at night. Uh, Speaking of brain waves, you know, there's a parasympathetic activation. If people aren't familiar, there's, you know, uh, in our autonomic nervous system, we've got a sympathetic and parasympathetic. And we all tend to be kind of fired up throughout the day from texts and emails and phone calls and, and your boss and coworkers. Uh, but uh, you really want to focus more on that parasympathetic activation where, you, where you're relaxed, where you're, you're promoting calm, peace, uh, and mindfulness. Um, I always used to confuse the two between mindfulness and meditation. Uh, but mindfulness really has to do with being present, being in the present moment. Uh, a lot of us, including myself, we tend to kind of focus on things in the past and in the future, and that's a problem because we're not there. We're we're only in the present, and thinking of things in the past which were stressful or worrying about what's going to happen isn't going to do you any good during that time when you're actually able to kind of focus on just being present and, and going to sleep. Uh, Could I add something to yeah, that absolutely. today? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so mindfulness has two parts, actually. One is being present, and the other part is um, equally, if not more important, is the non-judgmental part of whatever's happening to us now, simply being um, not judgmen- judgmental, whether that's good or bad, um, is sort of being okay with what is. Yeah, that, that's a great point, too, as well, because we all have a tendency to kind of beat ourselves up. In fact, the things that we tell ourselves in our head, if we if you told somebody else, they'd probably slap you in the face. Isn't that true? Yeah. So we, we do need to kind of, just like you said, be non judgmental, learn to let go, uh, don't focus on, on those things. And, and I found that this helped me a lot. I mean, I track my sleep using, you know, consumer and medical grade, almost EEGs, and, and, and I get a lot of feedback on how I do it every night on my sleep, and the more I do stuff like this, the higher my sleep scores go. There's been, uh, a, go ahead. There haven't been a lot of studies, but there have been a few studies done on um, mindfulness practice, and it's helped people with their insomnia as much as prescription medications. So, right. Yeah, I mean, which one's going to do more liver practice. damage? Yeah. yeah, Ambien or mindfulness, you know? <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Uh, I got a little bonus here for you as well, too. This is uh, just for people listening. Here's something that you can try tonight to see if you fall asleep a little bit easier. It's called a box breathing technique. Uh, and it's a very simple thing. Uh, and all you have to do is imagine you're on a square or in a square. And it's a breathing technique where you're going to breathe in for four seconds. So... One, two, three, four. You're going to hold it for four seconds. One, two, three, four. You're going to release for four seconds. One, two, three, four. And then you're going to breathe in for four seconds again. One, two, three, four. Actually, you're going to release for four seconds. You're going to hold and then breathe in. Sorry. So it's, it's a square. You're going up uh, four sides of a square. And what that does is actually that's been trained. Uh, that, that technique was trained. Uh, Navy SEALs uh, have been trained in this, and, and it actually almost comes from a combat training where if, let's say, they're captured and, uh, you know, the, the enemy is threatening to torture them, uh, they're actually trained to breathe like this to calm themselves down in that type of situation. So if you do, like, four or five rounds of this where you're breathing in for four, holding, breathing out for four, holding, and then breathing in, four or five rounds of that, I find that helps people out there people a lot faster. technique you can try it out tonight okay a uh, couple of things so this is might be getting out into the a little bit more into the woo world but uh, I, I 
pay attention to this stuff pretty diligently. Uh, EMF, uh, if you're not familiar with it, that's electromagnetic frequencies. Uh, mitigating them or, or getting rid of them has become important for me and my family. Uh, when I go to sleep at night, I put my cell phone on airplane mode. Uh, that way I am uh, shutting off all kinds of uh, transmissions of data and, and frequencies and, and uh, cell phone signals, which I don't need at night. I keep it away from my bed. Typically I'll put it on the counter uh, on the other side of the room. Uh, one of the other things I've done is my Wi-Fi router is on a timer. So usually around 9 o'clock at night, uh, Wi-Fi turns off. Uh, because I don't need that exposure of going throughout the house at night. Those Wi-Fi routers are pretty intense and they're pretty strong. In fact, if you fire up your Wi-Fi on your phone, you probably see, depending on where you live, you know, five to ten different other people's networks. I mean, all that stuff you're being bathed in at night, which, you know, may or may not be good for you. I tend to think it's probably better not to have that. So, uh, and and it's another signal for me because around nine o'clock at night, I see my Wi-Fi go off. Uh, on my phone, it goes back to, you know, LTE or whatever. I know that's the time to stop playing around with my phone and start getting ready for bed. So it's kind of a go-to-bed type clock uh, reminder. Uh, smart meters. Uh, again, this is, you know, if you have a, a more recent home or uh, your electric meter, uh, these new meters have, uh, they emit pulses. About every 20 seconds, there's a, a sharp spike in uh, radio frequency emissions, and they're basically for the... Um, power companies to come do readings without having to come on your house. The problem is, is those pulses can go uh, up to a mile in range. And uh, again, they're hitting you and your, your loved ones at night, which may be disturbing your sleep. Uh, so personally, I had one of those in my house. And as soon as I found out, I reached out to the uh, LADWP and had them come switch it out back for an analog meter because I didn't want that. Um, Microwave ovens, uh, I used to not know a lot about these, but uh, those are big, heavy-duty emitters of uh, electromagnetic frequency radiation. Um, I have one in my house, but uh, I've not used it anymore. I use a little toaster oven or the actual oven. Uh, and if you have any kind of curiosity about these, I mean, the, the best way to do it is just go, like, on Amazon. You can buy one of these EMF meters. Uh, they're pretty as cheap as 20 30 bucks, And you can walk around your house. And go by the microwave and fire up your microwave and see what it does to that. Uh, I, I also encourage you to go to your bedroom uh, towards your bed and your pillow where you sleep because that's where you're going to be. It's the most important. And make sure there's no sources of uh, crazy frequencies coming out because sometimes people will come in and they've done all the sleep hygiene. They've tried all the medications and, and they're still reaching for better ways to go to sleep. And, and maybe it might be coming from this one. Because this interfere, this, this will actually penetrate on a cellular level. Hopefully, you haven't lost too many people there. <laughs> uh, last one here is diet considerations. Uh, again, you know, it's funny. I was just listening to a different podcast on this expert on circadian rhythms, and he said, uh, "Good food at the wrong time becomes junk food," which was interesting. So. Uh, you definitely want to eat when it's time to eat and not eat when it's not time to eat. And that goes, uh, you know, as far as nighttime goes, within two hours of sleep or around sunset, if I can get dinner right around sunset, that's a good night. Uh, you want to avoid inflammatory foods at night, you know, things that are deep fried, lots of carbs, gluten. Uh, those are just going to raise inflammatory markers in your blood and just, again, interfere with, uh, with, with healthy sleep. Uh, alcohol is a big one. Uh, again, that, that could make you a little bit more drowsy uh, in the, on the front end, but uh, it can uh, interfere with your sleep cycles and sleep fragmentation further on. Um, and on top of that, if you snore or have sleep apnea, it's going to probably double uh, that amount on that night. Uh, and then the best rule of thumb with alcohol is stop about one hour per drink you have. In other words, if you have two drinks, two hours, because that's about the time it's going to take to metabolize. If you want to have some snacks at night, I recommend kind of low glycemic foods. Um, what I usually have is like a handful of walnuts or almonds or, or some berries, uh, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries. Those are my favorites. Uh, and then that goes um, also to healthy fats. So uh, I tend to have a lot of avocados, nuts, uh, salmon, extra virgin olive oil, MCT oil, which is a component of uh, bulletproof coffee, and uh, that's been quite popular these days as a derivative of coconut oil. Uh, those will actually help 
uh, fuel your brain and metabolic processes at night. So less likelihood, you know, some people said there's less likelihood of you waking up because you're giving your body a little extra dose of fuel so it can do its thing at night. And then obviously no caffeine after 2 p.m. Uh, stay away from coffee uh, in the afternoon, unless it's decaf, um, just to kind of help get some good sleep. And, uh, you know, a lot of teas have caffeine in them also. So if you're going to do a tea, a lot of tea make yes. sure it's an herbal tea. caffeinated tea. Exactly. Herbal tea is fantastic. And what else we got? Ah, okay. So uh, getting towards the end here, I just wanted to let people know that uh, if any of this stuff resonates with you, if you're interested, uh, we have an Instagram. It's called uh, Snow Experts. Uh, we've got a Facebook group called Snow Experts. Um, and I have a podcast. If people are into podcasts, which are quite popular these days, it's called The Best Night Ever. Uh, and I re- basically go week by week through these. We, get, we go in depth both between me and I get experts on the show to talk about uh, ways that you can improve your sleep through all these things that we talked about. If you are local in the LA area and you want to learn more about sleep or snoring or sleep apnea, you can visit me at Snore Experts at my practices. We've got locations all over LA. And uh, what else have we got? Any other slides? No more slides. I don't want to do a little giveaway. Yeah. So see. we don't have that much time, oh, so, but we'll do uh, we'll do maybe go over for about 10 minutes for chat questions. Um, please yeah. use the chat button. Um, if you want to see me, there's our email address, my website. If you want to see Dr. Krishani he, uh, and Dr. Berghoff, you may listen to their information on the last one. Um, the webinar will be posted yeah. in a few days on my website and on Dr. Krishani's website. Uh, at least right now, you can get it on my Dropbox. It's probably hard to remember that, but um, soon it will come on my website also. So let's open up the chat. Yeah, let's do some questions. Okay, so we started with Kelly. Um, can things like Cushing's permanently change sleep patterns? I used to sleep well and be a very early riser. Nothing helped me when it, my sleep when I had Cushing's. Now I find I do best in early morning, but this next best time is night overnight. I actually divide my sleep now so as not to fight myself, and I'm awake when I do best. Is it more important to keep fight, keep a regular sleep cycle? I think it's a great question. So our society has one sleep cycle, and you, Kelly, or the next person on the chat here, has a completely different cycle. So if you can get, if you can, if you have a job and a lifestyle that allows you to follow your own circadian rhythm, I think you've got to do that. You could try to change it slowly. As Dr. Krishani said, you can have morning light and avoid nighttime light. That will move your circadian rhythm a little bit earlier. But if you're on some circadian rhythm that you can't fall asleep till 4 in the morning and you sleep till, till 11 in the morning, you got to do that and try to work, make your work around that. Um, in terms of Christians, yes, Christian patients have notoriously bad sleep. When, you would, when you're cured from the Cushing's, as I said, when you're on cardiovascular replacement, you need some cortisol at night. Um, but once you're done with that, you, can, you may have other problems, growth hormone deficiency, thyroid problems, all the things like that can affect your sleep. Okay. Um, Michelle asks. Um, Hello? Regarding, uh, please mute your phone still. We're doing the chat. Uh, regarding CBD, I've tried a few different brands, doses, but I find it stimulates me at night rather than relaxing me. Do I need to try a different brand or dose? Is there a preferred dose for insomnia? What type of day should we take in? Mm. Dave, do you want to answer that one? Yeah. So, you know, I've tried a few different ones as well. Uh, for some people, it's not the right fit. And and um, that's just how it goes. Some people do better with it. Some people don't. Um, the recommended dose that I usually do is about 16 milligrams of the dial. Um and if you're going to do it, uh, best time of day to do it is, is at night, uh, as you're getting ready to go to bed. Uh, depending on the delivery, generally they, they tend to be kind of oral, sublingual, uh, right around bedtime. And then you know, make sure that you're mitigating the light exposure and, and all that as well too. So it might be a combination of some other things that you can kind of work in together, or stack as they say, and uh, yeah. see if that helps you. Yeah, I think that's a take-home lesson: is try a lot of different things. Try the light therapy. Try the Electronic therapy uh, treatment, the CB, uh, the, the cognitive behavior therapy, um, optimize your hormones, and hopefully some of those will, will work for you. And CBD and things like that. Estrogen. Yeah, it's, it's never one magic uh, bullet. It's, just, it's it's. Esther asks if I go to sleep at 10 p.m. constantly and wake up at 4 a.m. constantly, should I adjust my bedtime? 
And if so, what time should I go to sleep? Um, in general, people should try to get at least seven hours of sleep. So Esther's only getting six. Um, that may be detrimental, but uh, maybe she'll be okay on it. Uh, Dr. J, do you want to answer that question also? Yeah, I mean, again, yeah, I think seven hours is a good thing to shoot for. Eight hours, I think, is a little bit optimistic. Um, if you can, if you well, it depends. If you're trying to get a little bit more sleep, uh, try and go to bed at nine if you can, or, or find a way to get yourself into bed by nine. And if you wake up at four, then you're better off. Or uh, try to go to bed a little bit later and, and stay asleep a little bit later as well. So it, it, you have to kind of play with it a little bit. Okay. Um. Somebody asked a question here. They said, uh, what do I use for sleep tracking? Uh, so I use something called the Aura Ring. It's called O-U-R-A. Uh, it's a ring I wear on my finger. It's kind of like a Fitbit. Um, you can see it on my website on uh, smartspurs.com in the store. Uh, it's, it's, a fanta it's the best sleep tracker on the market, I think, right now. Uh, and I have a whole podcast. I actually have two podcasts dedicated to it. So it's called the Aura Ring, O-U-R-A. Uh, Linda asked, uh, probably for me again here, if you have hypopituitarism, uh, how do you know um, what supplements to take? I think she said, uh, one interfere with the medicines, especially cortisol. Um, I think, you know, in theory, one of the advantages of the supplements is they usually are more benign and they don't really affect things. Um, in general, the, some, most of the, many of the supplements lower your cortisol, which is good at the... Um, the um, actually some of the medicines that we talked about also lower your cortisol, which might be beneficial if you have high cortisol. Um, if you in general, we would like cortisol low at night. Um, so I was going to say certainly melatonin is safe to take. Um, so I would say most of these are probably safe, but you can ask me next time you have an appointment with me. Um, let's see. Then we have oh, lots of questions. I lots of questions. They're coming in faster than I can look at them here. Let me try to make this a little bigger. Uh, so I, I got the sleep tracking. Uh, and then I mentioned the professional EEG. So I use also what's called the Aries watermark. It's what I give to my patients for snoring and sleep apnea. So that's a, a medical test that I use as well. I don't use that one as often. Uh, I just use the uh, consumer version, uh, which is the Aura Ring. And uh, one of the things I think that Dr. Kashani and his group uh, do much better than most sleep experts is they do a home sleep study and not bring you into a, some kind of hospital where you're in a bed and hooked up to a bunch of electronics. So I think if you are going to do a sleep study, doing it at home is the way to go. Um, yep. You want to add on a little bit more on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's two options as far as it comes to getting a sleep study. If you're kind of curious about your sleep quality anyways, uh, yeah, you, I recommend doing a sleep study. The ones that we have are take home. Uh, the information that we get off of them is going to be, you know, how many hours you slept. How many times per hour you stop breathing, which is uh, sleep apnea, if you do or don't have it. Your oxygen levels, which is oximetry, which, which can tend to tank at night. A heart rate, which can tend to spike. Uh, we get uh, an EEG with REM sleep and uh, snoring levels, body position. It, it's a pretty in-depth report, so uh, dr uh, drill, drill deep into uh, your sleep architecture. Are there um, apps that actually measure your sleep or just the apps that measure your um your um, snoring? There are both. Yeah, there's some apps. There's actually a really cool app for people out there as well. It's called uh, Sleep Cycle, I believe. And uh, it's another way to wake up a little bit nicer in the morning. It basically tracks your sleep kind of off of motion. Uh, and you put the phone by your bed. Obviously, I would put it on airplane mode. And uh, it will wake you up at the latest stage of sleep so, uh, based off of kind of noise and body movements. And mm -hmm. um, People tend to have what's called sleep inertia uh, when they wake up. If they're in a deep stage of sleep and the alarm clock blows them up, that, then they're going to feel groggy. So if you want to wake up on a, on a happier note, you want to try and wake up in the lightest stage of sleep, and that app will actually figure that out for you. Okay. Sure. okay. Uh, I knew Janet was going to bring this up. Um, Janet asked Dr. Kishani, threw up to hear you talk about EMFs and our sleep. Uh -huh. and the are off the chart. I keep my house EMF-free almost. EMFs do interfere with sleep. There's more than blue light. I cannot use Wi-Fi. My Ethernet cable is faster. No need for Wi-Fi. Glad you eliminated the smart meter. Watch out for 5G. Yes. Yeah. So I love all of that. Watch out for 5G. That's been on my radar. Los Angeles is a 5G city. I don't think it's been, the switch has been flipped, but they've been testing it. Uh, I've seen. So I just saw something today in San Francisco that they're they're trying to ban 5G. If people don't know what 5G is, 
basically our phones right now are 4G, you know, one, two, three, four. Uh, 5G is not one more than 4G. 5G, uh, 4G goes up to, I think, 2.7 gigahertz. Uh, 5G goes from 5 gigahertz up to 90. Nine, that's nine zero. That's millimeter wave stuff. And that's the stuff that was used in World War II for uh, enemy combat. Uh, and it will basically fry you. It's, it's absolutely uh, it's going to be a big problem. Uh, so I'm concerned about that. Okay. Uh, uh, Lori asked about cabinets. I don't know what cabinets. Cabinets? What is that, uh, Dr. Yeah. Uh, Barber? What? I don't know what that is. Barber, Dr. Do you know Barber, do you know what that is? I'm sorry, I'm I'm trying to see the question. I don't cabinet cabinet C A K A V I N A C E. I am not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Maybe, uh, Lori can yeah. ask us um, again on that. Um, Michelle asks about EMF exposure to the bedroom. I I I is using a light box and wait wait wait. It's using oh, a light sorry, box in the morning. Just... Upon waking, good for resetting your sleep cycle. Yeah, how long is it used? How close should I have to my body? Okay. Uh, oh, I want to get back to Michelle. So it says regarding EMF exposure, uh, it's highest in the bedroom. It appears this is coming from outside of the be- building, not from within. What can I do to minimize EMF in this situation? Okay. Uh, one thing you can use, which uh, some people have recommended, is a um, paint. There's a special paint. I think it's on Amazon that actually has a. Uh, uh, metallic particles in it, which will block EMF, or you could get uh, almost looks like a mosquito net, and uh, it's made with a uh, heavy metal and uh, almost like a chain mail type thing, and that will actually uh, act like as a Faraday cage and, and block EMF uh, uh, penetrating the bedroom uh, or your bed itself, almost like a big mosquito net with a, a metal curtain. Yeah, it's some crazy stuff up there. Um, so what else we got? Okay, Lauren asked about phenobutyric acid. Yeah. You know about that? Sorry. All no. I know about phenyl, phenobutyric acid is related to GABA. So mm-hmm. I'm guessing it would affect the GABA levels. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I haven't really used it ex- in my patients. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tiffany asked a great question. I think we're all interested in this one. How do you wean off sleep medicine? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, most of the time, if you're, it depends on what class of sleep medicines we're talking about. If you're talking about the the Z medications, the non benzo benzodiazepines, a lot of times I I recommend people just stop the medication and you'll probably have two, it's about two or three nights of, of poor sleep, but, but you will adjust. It's not a long withdrawal period um, like the true benzodiazepines. Right. The benzos are much harder to get off of. They're very hard to get off of. Yeah. So it doesn't really, with, with the Z drugs, it doesn't really help to, you know, do a smaller dose, smaller dose. Um, You can, you can just go and, you know, stop them completely and just realize that, you you know, you'll suffer a few bad night's sleeps, but you'll, you'll definitely adjust. Is that what you, what you would recommend as well for your patients? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it could be a challenge. I mean, it's uh, modifications and, you know, tight, you know, slowly weaning off of them, trying different things, going over to the alternative sides uh, with supplements. Um, well, that's what I'd like to do, thinking. actually. The yeah. the supplements that you talked about, I would actually um, have someone do the the GABA or the um, um, what's or the, the CBD. other? Yeah, yeah the CBD. Yeah. Now that that's available, yeah. you, you can't get it all over the place, but um, if you can, I, I find that really helpful in my patients. Yeah. I was I was thinking, you know take a weekend and go out to the middle of a forest and get a rent a cabin with, with nothing out there and just focus on just reconnecting with nature. I mean, that's something that I want to do more often mm-hmm. here. And yeah. uh, I know that Absolutely. that will actually, and, and also sa- same thing with sun too. Uh, my relationship with sun has changed over the years. I used to be very phobic with the sun. Um, but I always recommend my patients get up during lunch, 30 minutes a day yeah. and just go for a walk, get the sun exposure. You're going to get vitamin D. You're also going to get your circadian clock 
That's great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that will potentially be tonight. Great. Um, what else we got? I think um, I think we'll sort of wrap it up here. Um, some of these are okay. sort of more specific here. But in terms of uh, Esther's question, the slides and the talk will be on my website, and I think they'll be on Dr. Krishani's website also. Um, I'll post it in a couple of days. Um, we'll put a little top thing at the top, um, you know, click here for the newest slides. Um, so, again, I thank everybody for joining us. It was great questions. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Krishani and Dr. Barbara, it was a great uh, webinar. We'll do it again soon. Um, email us if you want to uh, – suggest another topic, but um, it was really good, everybody. Thanks. Excellent. I just want to say, if you want to pick someone out there uh, that can... Oh, yeah. Let's, I don't let's know. How do you want to do it? Do you want to have um, first person to um, type in Snore Experts gets it? That works for me. Ha-ha. <laughs> Esther. Got it. Esther gets it. Okay. <laughs> Esther got it. Excellent. So how, yeah. how does she claim it? How does she claim her bribe? Bribe. Uh, you know, we'll get her information. Is she your patient, Doctor? No. No. Esther, uh, okay. you, um, email us or email me or. Email... Yeah, you know, you could email info at snoreexperts.com. Just yeah, send me your information, yeah. and uh, and we'll and I'll get that sorted out for you. Okay. Good job. Excellent. Thanks well, this is great. Thanks everyone for joining. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Bye.